The original Jurassic Park was a landmark moment in cinematic history. The Steven Spielberg film, based on the novel by Michael Crichton, not only was a massive box office hit, but it raised the bar for visual effects. By combining the amazing animatronics of Stan Winston with the computer wizardry of ILM, they managed to create some of the most realistic-looking dinosaurs that audiences had ever seen. The movie broke all sorts of box office records and won numerous industry awards. After seeing Jurassic Park, Joe Johnson, a longtime friend of Spielberg, called to ask him if he could direct the sequel. Johnson had a background in visual effects after working on the original Star Wars trilogy and Raiders of the Lost Ark. He also directed effects-heavy films like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and The Rocketeer. Spielberg told Johnson that he wanted to direct the sequel, but would keep him in mind if they decided to do a third. While Spielberg was working on Jurassic Park 2, The Lost World, Johnson was off directing the very successful Jumanji. Since Jurassic Park 2 was also a hit, the studio decided to move ahead with a third film, and Spielberg offered it to Johnson to direct. The script was written in 1999, and in the spring of 2000, pre-production started. When it came down to casting, they decided to bring back Sam Neill, who was in Part 1, but not in Part 2. They even joked about it in the movie. Or the incident in San Diego, which I did not witness. They hired Taya Leone, who had just finished three seasons of the sitcom The Naked Truth, and William H. Macy. Macy admitted that he was doing the film for his daughter, since he usually did serious films like Fargo and Boogie Nights. He wanted to make something that she could watch when she got a little bit older. The original script for the film involved several families on their way to the Galapagos Islands. They took two private planes, one with the kids and the other with the adults. The plane with the kids in it crashes into Isla Sorna, and the movie revolved around the kids trying to survive while their parents are trying to find a way to rescue them. Johnson thought it was too cluttered, and five weeks before shooting, he threw the script out. Because they already had a release date locked, they couldn't delay the film, so Johnson worked to fast-track a new script. Since they already had the sets built and the dinosaurs made, they looked into what they had and worked off of that. They took some chunks from the previous script and made a leaner, faster film. Now is about the son of a divorced couple that gets stranded on the island. The couple tricks Dr. Alan Grant to be their guide and hires mercenaries to protect them while they search for their son. They streamlined the story and Johnson was much happier with it. Although the five weeks went by very quickly and there were still a few scenes that weren't written until after they started filming. While rewriting the script, they wanted to go back to the wonder of the first film, which is why they introduced a different set of dinosaurs. They also went back to just having civilians on the island instead of the mercenaries from two. They consulted with notable paleontologists Jack Horner, who was their expert in the previous two films. He was there to keep the science as close to correct as possible. They did take some artistic license, of course, but that's filmmaking. The budget for the film was $93 million, and they scheduled for a roughly three-month shoot. Originally, they were going to film in New Zealand, but decided to move to some of the islands around Hawaii. A large chunk of the film was shot at various stages built within Universal Studios in Los Angeles. They did such a convincing job building the sets that many of the crew can't identify which scenes are in Hawaii and which ones are on set. Stan Winston's team designed dozens of various dinosaur models. The models were fully painted and matched their larger animatronic counterparts. The folks at ILM scanned the dinosaurs and used them to design the 3D models. With the new advances in computer technology, the team at ILM developed a new software that would emulate muscle movement. So now when the CGI dinosaurs would walk, you could see more detail than ever before, which added immensely to making them more lifelike. The T-Rex was the big bad for the first two films, so they wanted to have something different for the third. They introduced the gigantic Spinosaurus, a dinosaur that towered over the T-Rex. To show they weren't messing around, they had the Spinosaur kill a T-Rex earlier in the film, which reminded me of the movie Orca, when a killer whale kills a great white shark early on as a dig at Jaws. After working on films like Leviathan, Winston's crew knew that latex and water didn't mix so they developed a new material to encase the Spinosaurus, since there was a large segment of the film where the beast would be in water. The Spinosaurus had a 1,000 horsepower engine running it. It weighed 12 and a half tons. It was so heavy and fast that when it moved, the crew said it was like standing next to a bus as it went by. As with the previous movies, the dinosaurs were a mixture of practical and CGI. Some scenes were puppets, some were partial suits with a human inside, and others were computer animated. With this one though, they were able to have the bigger dinosaurs animated with hydraulics. This made the movement much more fluid and gave the puppeteers a wider range of movement to work with. Each film the teams worked on was used as R&D for future movies. In Aliens, working with the Queen Alien helped them when they were designing the larger dinosaurs in the Jurassic Park series. In Terminator 2, they learned how to blend CGI characters with real characters. They perfected it with Jurassic Park 3 to the point of where you had practical effects and CGI in the same scene and you couldn't tell which was which. 
With the new advances, the dinosaurs were able to do more acting in Part 3 than they were in the previous two. In the time since the first movie, paleontologists discovered that raptors had feathers. The effects crew wanted to make changes to the design of the raptors for the movie, but feathers were too difficult for computer animation at the time. So instead, they gave them quills, changed the features to match the new discoveries, and added more colorful markings. The animatronic raptors were incredibly complex and took 12 people to control one raptor. There were over 400 effect shots in the film, everything from the CGI dinosaurs to the blending of the matte paintings. For the scenes with the crowds of dinosaurs, they did lots of custom animation so that no two dinosaurs moved the same. The T-Rex in the beginning was a refurbished one from The Lost World. When the group was trapped in cages, some of the shots are of a CGI raptor, and others are of effects supervisor John Rosengrant in a full raptor suit. For the Pteranodon, they wanted to make it as a suit, but the movement was too awkward, so they went with CGI. The introduction of the creature was done purposefully to mimic that of a horror film. The baby Pteranodons took 20 puppeteers to control. The ones on the ground were puppets, and the ones jumping around were CGI. While the birdcage was a large set, they added CGI set extensions to make it look even larger. The scene of the parasailing in the beginning was a mixture of real life and CGI. The parachute opening was CG, and was using a new cloth simulator that ILM developed. For the plane sequence, there was a number of elements. The plane crashing was a miniature. They had four full-size planes built for the following parts. One that would crush from the outside, one that would crush from the inside, one that would roll, and one that sat tied in a tree. John Williams composed the iconic theme for Jurassic Park, but couldn't return to work on Jurassic Park 3 because he was working on the score for AI with Steven Spielberg. Spielberg and Williams both suggested Don Davis. Davis composed new music for the film and incorporated the main Jurassic Park theme for several key moments. After months of shooting and an even longer time in post, the film was released in the theaters on July 18th, 2001. It opened at number one with over $50 million and went on to gross $368 million worldwide. It was a hit, but it made significantly less than parts one, which made over a billion dollars worldwide, and two, which made $618 million. Critics and audiences were mixed. It was definitely a love it or hate it movie. Lots of people, myself included, argued that it was way better than the mess that was the lost world. Still, with the major drop off in ticket sales, the studio put the series on hold. This year, 14 years after Jurassic Park 3, Jurassic World is out. The movie is ignoring 2 and 3, and is a direct sequel to the first movie. The original concepts for Jurassic World were all over the place, with my favorite being that they developed dinosaur-human hybrid soldiers that hunted dinosaurs that got off the island and made it to a populated area. That would have been amazing! I think Jurassic Park 3 gets an undue amount of hate. A lot of work went into this, and after seeing it again, I seriously have no idea why people dismiss it so frequently. The story is much better paced than 2, the characters are likable, and the return of the combo of Winston and ILM made for creature effects that continue to look good today. The complaint I've heard the most was of the talking raptor scene. Alan. Uh, Alan. It was a small moment in the film that served two purposes. One was to inject a little humor, and two was to show that Dr. Grant had PTSD from his previous encounter on the island. Taken out of context, it looks silly, but in the movie, it's just a dream sequence. Meanwhile, in The Lost World, Jeff Goldblum's daughter really did use gymnastics to kick a raptor through a wall. Hey, you! I know some people complained about the scene where the Spinosaurus sneaks up on the group, but I thought that was the best scene in the movie. Yes, it would have been impossible for it to sneak up on them, but you know something? It's a movie. Some things you just gotta let go because it makes for a better scene. Not everything in a film has to be 100% accurate. Actually, could you imagine how boring that would be? If we're gonna factor reality into this, Jurassic Park would have been two hours of paleontologists uncovering dinosaur skeletons because they've been extinct for 65 million years. Thank <laughs> you.